was two or three years ago, uh, sponsored by the Center for Research on the Epidemiology of Disasters. Uh, so it's uh, uh, good to uh, uh, see you again. I want to also thank uh, my sponsors for a kind invitation to uh, come back to Denver. Uh, I used to, during my uh, government service, 22 years at the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, I would have to come to Colorado all the time because one of the federal offices, uh, Region 8, is located in, in Denver and we always have uh, we always had uh, CDC medical doctors and epidemiologists assigned to that office uh, downtown uh, Denver. And then after 9-11, uh, started to work much more closely with the U.S. military. And the U.S. military's new command on humanitarian assistance uh, was located, or I should say co-located, in Colorado Springs with NORAD. And that's Northern Com Command, or NORCOM, which is 100% devoted to domestic disaster relief in support of civilian agencies, as well as international disasters where the U.S. military would deploy assets like the Hospital Ship Mercy or Comfort or military doctors to provide aid after a hurricane in Haiti or uh, radiation <coughs> leak in Japan, uh, typhoons in the Philippines uh, uh, and whatnot. Uh, and uh, I was absolutely delighted to uh, be asked to speak uh, at, uh, at a forum which, until very recently, uh, and, and a field of academic uh, focus that I had not much experience uh, speaking at uh, during my years in medicine and public health. But since 9-11, uh, more and more of my talks are not strictly at medical schools or schools of uh, public health. They have been at uh, Georgetown School for uh, uh, Foreign uh, uh, Foreign Services. Uh, I'm going to be giving a lecture on a very similar topic in three weeks in Washington at the State Department's uh, uh, School for uh, Foreign Service, Foreign Star, uh, Foreign Service Institute. And so the recognition of, of disease, of health programs, as a very important part of this country's uh, foreign policy, how this country uh, achieves influence in the world or power in the world, uh, and how it supports virtually every single uh, U.S. aid program. Uh, the recognition that medical issues, public health, play a, a, a great role in projecting things this country does well uh, and is universally respected for. Uh, that's come about only fairly recently, but because of that, I'm being asked to speak at uh, departments of public policy, uh, foreign service, uh, and uh, actually even schools of business that uh, have uh, many of their students working for multinational corporations, and they have to know how to, how to take care of their, uh, uh, their personnel, as well as be aware of their potential uh, danger or threat to U.S. interest uh, in other countries. So, very delighted to be uh, asked to speak at the uh, Corbell School of International uh, Studies. And, of course, the personal tie also, uh, uh, when uh, after 9-11, I was assigned for a year and a half to the new Office of uh, Homeland Security, which at that time, uh, late 2001, early 2002 was part of the National Security Council, and my boss, uh, who I knew very tangentially at Stanford, I believe she's an alum, alumna of your school, uh, Condoleezza Rice, and uh, uh, have uh, subsequently in teaching at Georgetown, uh, there is a, a, I was, I've been on several panels with uh, Madeline Albright, whose father, uh, uh, established uh, school here, and uh, Washington uh, has, uh, I can't tell you how many meetings I've been at, at the State Department, at USAID, at global NGOs like Save the Children or, or Interaction or Care or Oxfam, uh, graduates of the University of, of Denver. Uh, 
So uh, it's good to uh, finally finally be here and cover uh, the topic of uh, public health, uh, medical relief, medical uh, programs in developing countries and their clear uh, link between uh, with other foreign policy goals and initiatives like the current focus on uh, public diplomacy uh, or soft power or smart power or what the military calls medical stability <coughs> operations. As I said before, uh, recently retired after uh, 20 some odd years uh, with the Centers for Disease Control, part of the U.S. Public Health Service, and uh, first day working as a, as a, as a doc uh, uh, at the very bottom of the Grand Canyon. Uh, one, actually, one of the side <coughs> canyons uh, have a supai, uh, a, a tribe that has been there for a thousand years, and in many cases uh, uh, living uh, in pretty much total isolation. And it was fascinating. Here we are probably 75 miles from the Strip in Las Vegas and working very much uh, under conditions and with the same health problems that I had seen in uh, Haiti and, and uh, parts of uh, Africa, but right here in the, uh, in the U.S. and within the U Indian Health Service and CDC assigned me there for six months. Uh, and that was my very first day at the clinic, which I, which I ran. Uh, was a great uh, experience working at CDC because uh, it afforded the opportunity to work internationally on assignment five years to the World Health Organization and UNICEF in Geneva, New York City, uh, to every, probably every single state health department, regional office, uh, other uh, organizations like the Pan American Health Organization, um, and uh, agent, other federal agencies like FEMA. U.S. Agency for International Development, and uh, I, mentioned my time, I mentioned my time at the uh, Office of Homeland Security, which ultimately evolved into our current Department of Homeland Security, a $38 billion uh, 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 enterprise, uh, basically. So it was a good, 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 uh, good run. I, I uh, uh, if I had to do it all over again, I, I would uh, have, I, I would not have done it any other way. It's hard working for the federal government and working in, in, in a bureaucracy and uh, there are frustrations getting things done, uh, learning of these very complex procurement acquisitions uh, uh, system, arranging simple travel from San Francisco to Los Angeles could take three weeks, but uh, it, was, uh, it was a good time and uh, I enjoyed it very much, mostly in the area of humanitarian assistance and disaster relief beginning probably with the Exxon Valdez uh, oil spill in the late 80s and ending with the Hurricane Katrina, uh, which unfortunately left me with a kind of a sour face because uh, of all the time and effort we spent training and educating uh, local health departments in Louisiana, uh, the uh, Gulf Coast, uh, coast of Texas, uh, and Alabama, uh, the federal response uh, left much to be desired, and I'm sure many of you remember the great criticism that the federal government uh, came under in the wake of uh, Katrina, and uh, the uh, particularly particularly FEMA, and of course there are still people living in displaced person camps and trailers, and now what are we, uh, five, six years uh, down the road, and this is in the United States. Uh, 5,000 people who still have not found uh, found housing. But it was a difficult time uh, working there, and I was ready for uh, for a break. So my last day of service, uh, get a goodbye from the boss, and Godspeed, good luck, and I decided that I wanted to, to uh, go into a different uh, business, and that was uh, <laughs> world, world traveler and uh, become a uh, sommelier, uh, an expert in wine, a professional <laughs> expert in wine, and I did uh, ultimately, uh, took me longer than going to medical school, <laughs> I passed my uh, uh, examination uh, after five five years, so I'm officially a sommelier, focusing on 
uh, New Zealand and South African white wines. <laughs> uh, this was uh, uh, what I had been dreaming about for uh, many years. Uh, this is in uh, Tuscany, uh, about halfway between uh, Florence and Pisa, in just uh, wonderful uh, both wine and cuisine areas. Uh, and I could have probably stayed there for the rest of my life, but uh, a couple uh, issues. Uh, compelled me to uh, come back to work in government and in disasters, and one of those was uh, I ran out of money. <laughs> it's, hard, it's, hard to, uh, it's hard to work uh, uh, just uh, consuming wine and good food, uh, and uh, no, one, no one paid me. Uh, <laughs> my federal pension, uh, unfortunately, did not cover the uh, lifestyle that I was becoming too accustomed to. Um, but uh, basically, uh, what changed my life, uh, and probably changed all of our lives, uh, everybody in the world maybe, every time you go to an airport, you have to go through security. Um, I mean, I, the, the, the things that have changed in our use of credit cards, and buying things, and, and going places, and getting medical care, uh, was affected by the events of this day. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's probably about 11.45 in the morning on September 11th, 2001. And I, I just love this, uh, this film because it shows uh, just after the, uh, the plane struck Building 2, uh, the second World Trade Center building, and you know, just across uh, the, uh, I think that's the Hudson or the East River, but this is New Jersey, and they're, they, they, they don't even know what's going on. I mean, they're uh, having a good time, and uh, uh, it kind of reminds me of what, some, what we see sometimes in, in disasters, uh, where people, don't, people ignore just unbelievable tragedies and catastrophes happening uh, very close by. Uh, for example, Joplin, Joplin, Missouri. This past uh, year, we've had the, we set the record number of tornado deaths in the U.S. Joplin, Missouri, in a two-hour period, uh, 350 dead. Uh, Three-day three -day outbreak of tornadoes, over a thousand dead. Uh, but uh, but very patchy, and uh, it was just amazing. Just 50 miles away from Joplin was uh, the, was another county. It was uh, the state state fair, and they were going on the fair uh, just as if nothing happened. 50 miles away, and uh, maybe it's human nature. Uh, denial or whatnot, uh, but had these people just turned around, they would have seen that their, their life had, uh, uh, was going to be changing, um, whether they knew it at that time or, or not. Um, having worked in the federal government, and this applies both to domestic agencies, whether it's Health and Human Services or HUD, Housing and Urban Development, or, or G GSA, or Office of Personnel Management, OPM. I know you've all heard this. OPM, uh, I used to think, meant other people's money. But <laughs> means, uh, uh, Office of Personnel Management, which takes up a great chunk of your tax payer dollars, uh, was affected, uh, is affected by these events. Uh, first, uh, if, you look, if you look at the history of legislation and the change in the way we respond to disasters domestically and internationally, it doesn't happen in a gradual evolutionary fashion. Almost always with disasters, uh, most of Congress and everything else are like this. And it takes a disaster like the World Trade Center to establish a whole new department. Uh, can you imagine uh, the bureaucracy and the administrative uh, challenge it was to take 57 uh, federal agencies and uh, divisions and programs and pull them into one brand new department. And that department was the Department of Homeland Security, which only came about because of the World Trade Center attack, 2,200 dead. And then three, three months later, the, the report of weaponized anthrax in the U.S. Postal Service fellow uh, first death was a gentleman in Boca Raton, Florida, uh, who, who died. 
and uh, then subsequent cases in Washington, D.C. We had 18 deaths of postal workers, a death in Connecticut, uh, actually uh, in Manhattan. Tom Brokaw, who at that time was uh, anchor for NBC News at uh, Rockefeller Center, uh, his personal assistant opened up an envelope. Anthrax uh, got on her skin. Uh, she fortunately did not inhale it. Uh, but uh, that weaponized anthrax within eight hours had burrowed from her skin to the inside of her mouth. Uh, and normal anthrax uh, does, not, does not do that. But those events uh, in totality uh, established the $38 billion uh, department. And what uh, reauthorized that, uh, that department and almost doubled the size of it was three years later, when Hurricane uh, Katrina uh, hurtled across the uh, Gulf of Mexico and hit New Orleans. Once again, another big, uh, big catastrophe, massive uh, national and global attention on, on uh, the performance of the federal government, executive branch, as well as legislative branch. And uh, it's, it's only because of that that uh, we had the establishment of new funding for bio, uh, biological terrorism countermeasures, uh, establishment, I mean, you're at an uh, academic institution, but uh, and because of Katrina, our budget for uh, uh, extramural research tripled at CDC. So we used to support three universities to focus on public health preparedness uh, within a year after Katrina, uh, we were supporting 300 uh, academic institutions to do research on everything from uh, triage and surgical management of potential uh, blast terrorism to use of the new social media, the Twitters, Googles, for early warning detection of a, of a, of a, of a potential epidemic, to nursing in disasters, to uh, to uh, oh, uh, law and ethics in disasters. Uh, it's a combined program at Georgetown and Johns Hopkins, which was to develop uh, guidelines for Congress to uh, create legislation, which basically, uh, how can we get around the Constitution to uh, protect our country against a biological attack where we have to involuntarily uh, arrest people voluntarily treat people, vaccinate them, uh, basically deprive people of their basic human rights. And not, not an easy uh, uh, decision to make by a, by a governor to uh, order mass evacuation. Um, and we're not talking about, uh, okay, here's this hurricane that's approaching Galveston Island. And even though Galveston Island, which is at sea level, uh, and was the site of the worst natural disaster in U.S. history, in 1900, 6,000 people died on Galveston Island in 1900. Uh, well, a year and a half ago, another hurricane approached uh, Galveston, stronger than that 1900 uh, event. Uh, Galveston had uh, probably a thousand times more people living uh, on, on that island compared with 1900. Still, people, a lot of people refused to evacuate. But that's all voluntary. In a bioterrorist attack, chemical attack, uh, dirty bomb, uh, nuclear improvised device attack, uh, there's no ands, it's or buts, uh, buts. You're, you're evacuating. Boom, that's it. And you've got federal troops, not National Guard. You've got federal groups, on the, federal forces on the ground uh, enforcing the, <coughs> uh, the commands of the President of the United States, not going through the governor, not going through Posse, posse Comitatus, which is state sovereignty, and normally a governor would have to make a request to the president that uh, our resources are not, in, are not able to handle this earthquake, or this hurricane, or this flood, and we need uh, federal assistance. Uh, a nuclear attack on this country, a bioterrorism attack, well, I'm sorry, a bioterrorism attack involving either smallpox, anthrax, or bubonic plague are considered, until proven otherwise, an attack on this country by a foreign aggressor. And that, uh, in the Constitution, because it's in the second paragraph, and they assign responsibilities to the federal government 
uh, defense of this country was one of those uh, one of those responsibilities, and that's why we had the Civil War because each state thought they could do anything they want. The only role of the federal government was to protect us against uh, if the British come back and try to uh, uh, take back uh, take make us colonies again. Uh, but um, what's not widely known is uh, a, a nuclear attack or an attack by certain uh, disease vectors, disease agents of such catastrophic uh, magnitude that they threatened uh, the survival of this country throughout all the books uh, except the Constitution and the federal government can respond. Well, here in uh, Katrina, once again, we have an event, massive federal uh, uh, criticism, big big uh, uh, finger pointing uh, afterwards, uh, Congress is embarrassed. Uh, what's, what does the federal government do whenever uh, something goes wrong, whether it's uh, uh, oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico because of corporate negligence and lack of appropriate environmental safeguards, or I should say enforcement of safeguards, it's to throw money at the problem. First they, they throw money at a uh, billion dollars to study the problem. And they uh, spent a couple more billion dollars to uh, 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 let uh, let Congress uh, do a GAO report or a, a CRS Congressional Research Service report, and then that leads to uh, uh, potential legislation, and then that leads to the influx of lobbyists who have, uh, want, want the new center for uh, development of smallpox vaccines. We want that in the state of Colorado, and. Uh, all these pressures come to bear, and just more money gets thrown at the, uh, the problem. And my experience is there's no correlation between the amount of money a program has and success. And in my mind, success is defined as a uh, uh, number of lives saved uh, and lifetime disability uh, uh, avoided. But Hurricane Katrina. Uh, was certainly another one of these landmark events which changed our government uh, substantially. And if you look at FEMA itself, FEMA is not that old of a department. FEMA is now part of the uh, Department of Homeland Security. It was one of those 57 agencies which was pulled into, in, I, in my opinion, a very big mistake. Because uh, during the previous administration, the director of FEMA, reported directly to the president. James Lee Witt directed, was, 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 was in the cabinet. And if he needed something, he would just uh, ask President Clinton immediately uh, that we have shortfalls uh, uh, in dike, uh, in experts in flood mitigation, and in construction of dikes uh, at the mouth of the Mississippi, which actually uh, was uh, uh, that, 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 that area. Uh, this disaster is probably the most widely predicted disaster uh, in all of the federal government emergency response agencies. In my budget, probably if I look at all the states, territories that CDC provided training and trained the trainers and assigned uh, CDC staff to, over my whole career, Louisiana received the most federal assistance. No disaster, it was all preparedness. Uh, FEMA probably spent more money on Louisiana than any other state, all in preparation for this event. And what happened? Uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, people who were trained were no longer in responsible positions for disaster, and uh, the Fed's uh, uh, performance was perceived to be so bad that President Bush uh, fired the FEMA director in the middle of a disaster. I mean, that's unprecedented and appointed the, uh, a Coast Guard Admiral to be the lead federal coordinator for Hurricane Katrina. And this, this happens both domestically and, and internationally. Internationally, this was an event which uh, brought up something which I never thought of before. Usually, when I think of international disaster relief, there are, there's a refugee crisis in uh, Sudan, uh, you've uh, got refugees in Darfur, and we send American food, water, sanitation, medical care to uh, Sudan. Earthquake, tsunami in Sudan. We send uh, uh, nurses. We send. We deploy the U.S. naval ship Mercy, and we just go there. Well, this was the very first time 
uh, where we were getting lots of requests from other countries that uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, British Oxfam, uh, Médecins du Monde, uh, other countries wanted to send assistance because we needed it. We, we, we didn't have enough doctors, we didn't have enough medications, but we had no mechanism on how to accept foreign medical volunteers in terms of licensing them to see patients. We had uh, no way of, uh, of approving foreign drugs, which are basically the same type of drugs we would have used, but uh, they, were, uh, they, they were made by, uh, by a German pharmaceutical company. I mean, the complexity of uh, handling foreign volunteers, uh, we just ne never had to deal with before. And it was because of Katrina that we now have specific guidelines that uh, provide waivers for uh, doctors from Haiti or doctors from Germany or trained in the EU system or from Japan. I mean, there's a, there was a team of, I remember, a hundred Korean, South Korean uh, doctors with a fully staffed intensive, intensive care unit that landed at the airport. We could have used, uh, but it just sat there um, because uh, it, it, it did, the, I, the ICU did not fit the JCAH, Joint Commission on the Accreditation Hospital, uh, standards for uh, an ICU uh, in a hospital, even though every single hospital uh, was either out of commission uh, or, uh, or had ev evacuated its staff in the city. Could have used that. Didn't use it because there's no administrative uh, mechanism to accept foreign volunteers, foreign equipment, and foreign medications. So here's an example of what probably most of us, most of us would have thought of as a purely domestic event, uh, but with uh, very uh, strong uh, uh, international uh, uh, impact. I mean, uh, we were getting calls from the, the ambassador from many, many countries asking, what can we do to, uh, to help, help that we needed, but uh, we did not know how to accept it. It was just like after, uh, oh, uh, this, this disaster also was the first time that uh, the corporate sector was offering assistance on providing free wireless services, uh, GPS to find uh, missing children who were separated from their parents. Uh, I was out there with, I had to use my own cell phone uh, in the field because we didn't have cell phones at CDC to pass it out to everybody. And I worked, I had the cell phone going you know, 24 hours a day uh, for 14 straight days. I, my, my, my cell phone bill was $4,000 and the director of CDC, Michelle Remain Nameless, told me, uh, uh, don't worry about it, FEMA will reimburse you afterwards. Uh, so, uh, here we are uh, six years later and uh, FEMA has not uh, responded to my request for reimbursement, even though I'm working at FEMA right now. Uh, at any rate, uh, at, in any of these events that are very high visibility uh, with international press, media attention, uh, going to work uh, was not fun, and uh, digging you're being criticized. And uh, this was uh, the situation. I probably could have backtracked to fall of uh, 2001 when CDC, we were trying to solve the anthrax attack. And as you probably remember, uh, international attention, uh, we were getting calls from BBC, CNN, every major newspaper wire service in the world and trying to do science and trying to find what type of anthrax is this? Well, for one thing, is it anthrax? Where did it come from? And what's the treatment? Uh, there is no treatment for weaponized anthrax of a highly purified, uh, manufactured uh, case. And uh, going to work and trying to uh, uh, work with uh, uh, the press, work with uh, frantic state and, and District of Columbia Health Departments, uh, and uh, ultimately, we our, our bad performance at working with the public. Because uh, we never, believe it or not, CDC, in 50 years, we had never had a, a press briefing. A, a press briefing where, like they have at the White House uh, or at the Department of Defense where you have a lot of reporters there. And one shot, you can uh, tell them what's uh, going on or what, what's not going on. You have a press officer who's usually pretty good at... Uh, at what to say or uh, 
how to say things uh, without lying, uh, how to say, uh, uh, use phrases that they don't know without saying, I don't know. Uh, we didn't have any of that training. Our press office at CDC was three people, and none of our doctors had, had, had any idea. Uh, they looked upon the, we looked upon the press as, as impediments to solving this problem that was killing people. Um, and as a result, uh, our, our perceived bad performance, our bad performance was in media relations, and we forgot the number one uh, principle of public health. Public health is not medical care. Public health is not one-to-one -one medical care. Where we're taught from day one that the secret in caring for the patient is caring for the patient, listening to the patient, and uh, and uh, uh, providing information to the patient to make to allow them to make informed uh, decisions. But when we're dealing now with our patient is the community, saying things like no comment or get out of my face or not returning calls. Uh, sometimes no information is worse than bad information because that's when rumors started and the rumors that broke out afterwards uh, all of them incorrect uh, that anthrax was communicable ultimately led to the firing of our director. The director of CDC was, uh, was fired during, uh, during the anthrax uh, uh, crisis. So we've come a long way um, but we still have a long ways to go. Um, when I said that just having a lot of money doesn't solve the problem. Uh, it did. Uh, it did establish sustainable organizational units. We now have a permanent unit at CDC devoted towards uh, both domestic and international humanitarian assistance. But as with everything in the government, they overreact. Uh, we went from a press office of three people to a department of media affairs. Uh, research where yeah, of 800 people and they're, they're, they're doing research on Twitter uh, use uh, in potential in early detection of an epidemic uh, use of, uh, of Facebook uh, updates uh, and if you have 10,000 people saying they have headache visual blurring bloody diarrhea just north of Minneapolis which happens to be one of the major terrorist targets it's the biggest mall in the world uh, or Las Vegas, which is the city that is number one on the terrorist attack list. Uh, you know, if you have got 10,000 cases, uh, uh, not cases, but people say, I don't feel well uh, 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 on Facebook updates, uh, maybe that means something. It could be red herring, but those are things that uh, the CDC media office has the money now to, to look at, and it's, 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 it's great. But is it really necessary when uh, our budget for bioterrorism is greater than our budget for what I think are more important uh, national health problems like heart disease, cancer, AIDS, uh, or globally uh, combating childhood communicable diseases, easily curable, easily treatable like diarrhea, upper respiratory tract infections, malaria, uh, HIV AIDS. I mean, the amount of, amount of uh, uh, budget support that goes to those uh, global health problems uh, is minuscule compared to bioterrorism. And I'm not talking about, okay, nuclear terrorism, uh, blast terrorism, chemical weapon uh, attacks. Uh, I'm not, I'm talking about biodefense is more than 25% of the uh, CDC's uh, annual, annual budget. Uh, but one thing I, I most of, uh, most of uh, the talks that I have given over the years have pretty much strictly focused on important field, uh, field uh, th things we can do in the field to take care of patients in a disaster, whether it's an earthquake uh, where you need uh, sophisticated surgical and medical interventions, uh, and you may need to portable hospitals to floods where people really don't die, but uh, you'll have problems of uh, potential outbreaks of disease. People come back to their homes which have water in them and they've got uh, mold growing all over the place and if they have asthma, uh, they could get uh, fungal infections and, uh, or they go back home and they get electrocuted. Uh, uh, th these issues are, are very important, but the more important issues are not addressed very well in uh, the training of our 
medical community, and that's at the policy level for disaster prevention, mitigation, preparedness, and planning. Because, uh, and we should know better, because our mantra at CDC is uh, uh, an ounce of uh, prevention is worth a, a, a pound of cure. Uh, if you can prevent something from happening by immunization, for example, and you don't have a, a flu outbreak, I mean that that saves a lot of money uh, as well as as well as lives. But we haven't converted that yet. Thinking uh, to disasters by if we can prevent the disaster from happening, if we could uh, uh, be more prepared in stockpiling the appropriate uh, medications and, and drugs, and if we train our staff. Uh, how to work with the media so that uh, they, we can use the media to get out the word to the public on the important uh, public health measures to take so they don't come down with diarrheal diseases or influenza after a uh, after a flood. So every community, one thing, uh, is at risk from natural hazards which create an urgent need for public policies and strategic plans to prevent, mitigate, mitigate, uh, in, from uh, the perspective of an emergency manager, uh, but we don't use that term too much in public health, mitigation. That's where we can't prevent the disaster, but what can we do to minimize the impact? So, earthquake in LA, for example, uh, with no measures taken at all, uh, magnitude 7.0 would be estimated to kill uh, 300,000 people. With appropriate uh, retrofitting of housing, with appropriate citizen safety education of what to do when a building shakes, uh, we can decrease that uh, <coughs> impact to 25,000. That's called mitigation. Uh, and then obviously uh, preparedness, uh, training and, and education. Uh, disaster impacts uh, uh, all elements of, of, of society. Um, in, poor, in poorer countries, uh, unfortunately, those most impacted are, are the poorest because those are the ones who can't afford to build houses which are up to the latest building codes. And they tend to be very, very uh, what we call uh, lethal construction. Uh, and uh, this whole issue of a uh, very hot topic now of, of uh, urban sustainability, uh, environmental health, uh, 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 sustainable energies that don't uh, uh, pollute the environment, I think uh, are now being thought in a much broader term, uh, and I think that term urban security, uh, both for everyday life, uh, you know, not having to uh, breathe dirty air, uh, the, 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 you eat proper uh, nutritional food, uh, but in poor countries, uh, they can't afford these things, they can't afford to take measures. Uh, but uh, in, in, more, in more wealthy countries, uh, the impact of a disaster is more than, than just deaths and injuries. Uh, we still have not recovered from Hurricane Katrina. As I said before, 5,000 people still homeless. We have not even uh, recovered yet from Hurricane Andrew, which I worked at south of Miami in 1992. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, President Bush, 43, did exactly what his father did after Hurricane Andrew. The federal government came under enormous criticism for very slow response in 1992 to Hurricane Andrew. Local government, local emergency manager of Dade County, Florida, went on BBC and CNN and just bashed, uh, bashed FEMA. Um, and George Bush, senior, uh, got rid of the FEMA director and sent Andy Carr down to coordinate the uh, the response to Hurricane. Hurricane Andrew, but if you look at that area in Miami, it still has not recovered. And I'm still working on long-term studies following up a cohort of people who were impacted in uh, August 1992. So here we're talking almost 20 years later, 40% still unemployed, uh, statistically significant greater incidence of chronic diseases, depression, anxiety, interfamily violence, uh, and uh, and psychological uh, uh, problems. I'm mean, just off the board compared with the non-disaster affected area. So these are things that uh, that we don't think about. The, uh, let alone the loss of tax base. Uh, that hurricane destroyed the Air Force base, Homestead, south of Miami. 
that uh, the area around Palms of the Air Force Base had a community of businesses to support the work of that base, as well as to provide employment for uh, family members uh, of service uh, of, of the Air Force uh, service men and women, jobless, uh, loss of function due to disability, and of course that has a major impact in the poorest countries because uh, if you can't if you can't work, uh, you may starve. Uh, or to depend upon the uh, the uh, charity of neighbors or or your own, or your own family, losing losing your hand, lose, uh, losing your leg, which uh, uh, we don't think of too much in a disaster in this country. Okay, they get fitted out with a new uh, artificial limb, which can be controlled by electrical impulses in your brain. Newest research uh, uh, has actually developed. Uh, Incredible artificial limbs, places like Stanford and uh, MIT, uh, where the, uh, the, the the technology of artificial limbs is tremendous. I mean, heck, in, in, in countries like Cambodia, Mozambique, Angola, uh, people who lost their legs by stepping on landmines, which are still a major problem, uh, they're lucky if they get a very crude, manufactured artificial limb by one, by an international uh, uh, aid organization. So the challenges that we have, um, despite uh, recognition that disasters are a major problem, uh, that disasters are a major uh, global health problem, are a major foreign policy uh, issue that the U.S. government needs to attend to, uh, both from a humanitarian perspective, that's why we have agencies like the uh, U.S. Agency for International Development, which has the Office of U.S. Foreign Disaster Assistance, while the U.S. State Department has the Bureau for Population, Refugees, and Migration, why HHS has an Office of Global Affairs, why CDC has uh, all of these, uh, at least it's recognized that the, that the disasters are now you know, something that we should be attending to domestically and internationally, with the added factor now and uh, particularly for those of you who uh, are interested in uh, foreign policy uh, or health in the context of foreign policy or disease as a national security threat, which was not recognized until 2000. Uh, if, you, if, I, if I had mentioned that uh, cholera or SARS or pandemic influenza should be addressed by the National Security Council uh, that I would either would have been silenced, yawning, or I would have not been asked back to a meeting uh, at the, uh, the NSC. It was because of a very influential report. Called, it was the uh, annual NIE, National Intelligence Estimate, that was published, uh, non-classified, public domain by the CIA, called Disease and National Security in 2000. That changed everything. And it's only very, very few times I mean, so much is published by the U.S. government, uh, and very few documents change policy and change the way we do things. Very, very few things. Uh, that was one of them. Disease as a national security threat, uh, both domestically and, uh, and internationally. And that was 2000, not that long ago. Uh, so a big problem, uh, increasing population numbers living in disaster-prone areas, unfortunately. Uh, where, where are... Uh, where in globally, where, where, where is the population increasing the most, and where, and where are uh, we getting large accumulations of very, very poor people living in the most uh, awful circumstances? They happen to be on the most active uh, fault zones. They happen to be on coastal areas that are below sea level, like on these offshore islands in Bangladesh where uh, every 20 years or so there'll be a cyclone, cyclone coming up the uh, Bay of Bengal and causing catastrophic numbers of death. Uh, for example, the 1970 cyclone in Bangladesh uh, killed 800,000 people. Uh, 800,000 people. But uh, if you survived, uh, you were relatively uh, uninjured. Um, but the world at large uh, responded very, gener very generously. But they didn't know anything about disasters. It, disasters was not even worthy a uh, study of, it was not worthy academically of something to be taught, studied, or do research on. Uh, 
but that disaster with all of the inappropriate assistance, sending teams of surgeons, blood, intensive care units to Bangladesh, uh, people were emptying out their medicine cabinets and sending birth control pills, diet pills. You know, people needed food, but sending diet pills to make them not hungry is not the way to, <laughs> not the appropriate intervention. <laughs> uh, and sending down jackets and sleeping bags to Bangladesh, where coldest time of the year might be over 100 degrees Fahrenheit and very humid. I mean, people do this out of the goodness of their heart. Uh, but just being, that just doesn't cut it anymore. I mean, just being a do-gooder, uh, unless you do the right things, uh, particularly NGOs, won't be funded. And that's one of the things that I wanted to discuss uh, today, but maybe not have, have time. So uh, un unfortunately, we've got so many things going on, both with uh, large population growth in parts of the world where we're going to continue to have the most disasters. Pacific Rim, uh, for example, and the, uh, the, the importance of disasters at the, uh, and I was in Honolulu uh, last month at the uh, Asian Pacific, uh, actually, it's APEC or APAN, I can't remember. Uh, it was a big meeting of all the uh, leaders of countries around the Pacific Rim. President Obama was there, and uh, a whole day was spent on the impact of global climate change, poor use of resources, uh, uh, leading to unsustainable uh, industries, uh, energy use, uh, uh, rise, a global climate change causing rise in water levels, causing contamination of aquifers, uh, which these small island nations depend on. I mean, Hawaii, all of our water, and I'm from Hawaii, uh, we, all of our water is, uh, is well water, but with uh, rising sea, wall, sea level over the course of the next five, 10 years, we're not talking 100 or 1,000 years, we're talking a, a decade. Uh, contamination of this water, uh, making, uh, or, or contamination by pesticides, by, uh, by agriculture, will make this water uh, not usable for agriculture. So you're gonna have, you might see a pretty significant decrease in agricultural production in probably every single island nation uh, in the Pacific, and that is everything from islands off the coast of South America to uh, to the Philippines. And you have decreased agricultural production, you have decreased food production, you have decreased uh, food, you have nutritional deficiencies. Uh, what is that? What happens? Uh, what happens then? Well, okay, you have starvation. You have people more susceptible to getting sick. And from a national security perspective, uh, you have population migration. People are going to leave to, to, to get food, to find jobs. Where are they going to, where are they, where are they going to come? Well, Hawaii, uh, Australia, uh, the west coast of, of the U.S. There are, uh, uh, people are very in, 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 have a lot of ingenuity in, uh, in avoiding uh, immigration and customs. Look what, we see, uh, look what we see on the border between uh, the U.S. and Mexico. Uh, what's going to happen when we have a regime change in Cuba? Uh, either it's going to be violent. Uh, is there going to be lots of uh, wave upon wave of uh, boat people like we saw in the uh, 1980s with the Marilita's boat lift uh, of thousands of, uh, of, of, of Cubans uh, coming, uh, coming ashore? Uh, these are the things which, or, or uh, uh, people will be uh, moving to other, other countries, uh, other island countries, social tensions, religious tensions, resentment against this, uh, this new group. Uh, competition for res uh, scarce resources. Uh, future wars are not going to be fought over oil. Uh, as interesting as that, a talk at the uh, Pacific Center for uh, what was it called the C uh, Center for Pacific uh, Security in Honolulu, primarily Department of Defense funded. But I mean, I was so sh shocked. They said that the number one threat that we have in the Pacific is global climate change, decreased uh, food production. Uh, Nutritional deficiencies, population movement, uh, tensions between countries, and big time problems for this country dealing with mass influx of, of people from these countries uh, that are having uh, having big problems, and that's going to affect that's going to affect Hawaii and it's going to affect Guam. Hawaii, we only have uh, two day two day supply of uh, 
of food, water, and energy. Hawaii, I, mean, I, I was just pretty much blown away by that. Just two days, I thought, gosh, you know, it must be a couple months, but uh, if even uh, one of our states has that problem, what about, what about other countries? Uh, destructive and unconventional warfare, uh, such as, such as uh, or another term for that is asymmetric warfare. Very weak, weaker, weaker, uh, uh, weaker enemies use other unconventional methods to uh, cause great destruction. Not by killing people, maybe, but perhaps just by destroying our economy. It might be uh, spreading anthrax over agricultural areas in California and making that area non-arable, basically, because you've got anthrax there, and anthrax spores live for over a century, and. Uh, uh, it just or it's what's like what happened after the Chernobyl disaster in 1986, breadbasket of the former Soviet Union, Ukraine. Uh, you've got hundreds of uh, square miles of the world's richest soil uh, could grow. Uh, well, it had been where uh, much of the bread and wheat had been grown, non arable because of long, long lived isotopes from the, uh, the Chernobyl disaster. Well, anthrax is unlike other biological terrorism agents. Is more like a hazardous material. It's spores that can uh, that we inhale a spore, uh, they germinate, and uh, uh, that's what that's basically what, what kills you is uh, they germinate and they, they form uh, the bacteria. The bacteria produces a toxin. Your body develops an antibody reaction against those toxins, and it's your body's antibody, your body's reaction that kills you, not so much the bacteria, which makes treatment very very difficult. Uh, so these challenges of water, energy, and food, unfortunately, uh, what I gathered at the APAN meeting uh, last month, that uh, many of these threats to our nation are beyond the tipping point of recovery. Uh, uh, we have been warned a long time about the impact of global climate change, of uh, threats to especially a biodiversity. I, I, thought, I always thought that was a, you know, a, an ecological problem not much to do with uh, national security threats. That's why we have a national park system. But uh, big time uh, threats uh, uh, <coughs> on uh, our production of, we, we lose uh, uh, a quarter of the forest in Borneo uh, that, that loses cures for 40 diseases. I mean, we don't think about that, but uh, despite our great advances in chemistry, most of our drugs come from natural products or are discovered from natural products, and then the chemical uh, base of those natural products are, are synthesized. So our future, I think uh, 130 is uh, where we end. I'll, I'll conclude here. Our future disasters are almost all going to be transnational, uh, particularly if it's a, uh, a medical uh, disaster like a pandemic of one. Uh, <laughs> And that, that uh, I, I, I was just so amazed uh, when I was in China, and, look, and China's economy is, is booming. You're developing a class, a middle class, and an upper middle class. Same thing in India. Uh, people uh, have disposable income for the first time in uh, maybe ever, are able to travel. Well, there are nonstop charter flights from Chengdu, uh, Xi'an, uh, parts of China in the interior, Guangzhou prefect, uh, Prefecture, the heart of, uh, of uh, influenza country. This is where every single major catastrophic uh, epidemic in history, whether we're talking about the Great Plague in 431 BC, which Athens <coughs> lost the Peloponnesian War because of that, uh, killed Pericles and half the half 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 Athenian soldiers, uh, Great Plague, uh, Black Plague in 1349 to 1351, Bubonic plague that started in China. Uh, every single major pandemic influenza outbreak this century, the big one in 1918, 1919, which uh, killed 500,000 Americans and will probably kill more when it comes again. Notice I said when it comes again, because we have no better way of treating uh, that type of influenza now than we did in 1918. It's a virus. Uh, viruses are not killed by antibiotics. I give several flocks and see if you had uh, anthrax, but there's no such thing as anti, an, very few what we call antivirals. What we do have now is we have ways of keeping you alive 
buying you a chance that you can survive until your body is able to fight back uh, the swine influenza or avian influenza, we put you on a respirator. Because what do people die of in influenza? You drown. You drown in your, your, own, your own body's, uh, you develop uh, a, a pneumonia, your lungs fill up with water, and you uh, die in your sleep. It used to be called old man's comfort because uh, of its painless. Uh, that was the way that people uh, would have preferred to die back in the 1800s, uh, slow death overnight. Well, that's, why, that's how you die in, in, in influenza. 1918, 1919, they didn't have ventilators or respirators. They didn't have uh, people who could sit there and <coughs> breathe for you for uh, a couple of weeks. Now we do. Unfortunately, uh, this country, we only have 15,000 ventilators. 15,000 ventilators. More pe uh, if we're going to be having uh, probably 100 million infected people, uh, that's... Uh, that's an issue that uh, uh, we still haven't come up with a good answer yet. But uh, it's a global world now, transportation. There are now charter flights from the heart of a uh, pandemic country in China, direct to Chicago. They have uh, uh, expedited clearance through immigration because they've already gone through that in Chengdu with the passport office. They have uh, expedited baggage. They go right from the plane onto a tourist bus. No. 300, boom, right, right, uh, and uh, SARS, uh, you're, not, you're not symptomatic for, uh, for a week. So you could be infectious, but not sick. You don't, you don't look, you, you, look you, feel, you feel great. But uh, uh, you, spread, uh, you spread SARS not by coughing on people. SARS is, is spread by uh, your, your body secretions getting on a table, shaking hands, and then people touch their nose or uh, pick their nose, and that's how, that's how SARS is spread unlike influenza, but uh, uh, we, we've got, uh, we, we, we've, we've got, a, we've got a, a time now where Ebola virus, for example, in Kinshasa, uh, dreadful disease, never would have heard about it in this country uh, 50 years ago or 100 years ago. Now it's an eight-hour flight from Kinshasa to Brussels, another eight hours from Brussels to uh, uh, New York City, and uh, if you were infected by Ebola virus, uh, uh, as happened in Kikwit in uh, uh, 1996, uh, you could spread Ebola, uh, and because you don't look sick, you might start to get a little, little flushed by the time you get off the airport at Kennedy. But they probably think you're just drunk, you're, uh, particularly if you're coming from first class. You get <laughs> unlimited uh, <laughs> stuff. Uh, cyber terrorism, uh, global narco terrorism, forced population migration. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, food, uh, war, like we've seen in, uh, in uh, Sudan for the past 50 years, global human trafficking, new technological catastrophes. An example would be modified uh, biological organisms that uh, have characteristics of one uh, type of uh, bacteria or virus that's a killer, but not very contagious, and combining it with the characteristics of a bacteria which is pretty harmless might be a normal uh, bacteria in your bowel or on a desk, combining them so you have now a killer which is easily uh, easily transmittable. Uh, and we have ways of doing that. Uh, uh, new diseases will continue to emerge, diseases which I never heard of in medical school. I'm old enough where when I was in medical school, I never heard of AIDS. And, uh, First report of AIDS was my second year of second week of internship, and the gay community <coughs> there is who had a weird type of cancer that just don't see him. I no one read it basically because it was, but that ultimately was the AIDS epidemic. Um, so I think I'll I'll I'll, I'll end on, on that note that we've got all of these major challenges that are new challenges that despite all of our investment in developing uh, global response to pandemic influenzas, great, great structures domestically with FEMA, Homeland Security, uh, none of those, uh, of those new hazards or re-emerging hazards, I think, are adequately addressed to protect, to protect our country from a national security perspective, as well as to prevent these epidemics from uh, coming directly uh, into the heart of this country. And these, some of these diseases we are not able to treat any better than we were uh, 100 years ago.
if anyone has any questions, then, uh, please go ahead. Um, you, you mentioned slightly early on the role that corporations played uh, during the Katrina disaster relief, and a lot of corporations, and transnational corporations, have now been providing HIV medication in certain African countries. Would you suggest that that's possibly a scope for an integration of state strategies and transnational corporation strategies? Do they have a role to play? Or is it something... Uh, as a matter of fact, today, uh, let me just... Uh, can I can I uh, show the uh, you know the, the shot where you have uh, all of the slides you can see them I just want to jump quickly uh, today the whole uh, in Davos uh, well Trumpen uh, the head of the uh, health and politics and uh, are so intertwined that a very powerful uh, fund the global fund which has more money than uh, WHO that their uh, their boss was fired uh, two days ago for internal. Accusations of corruption. I don't know who's going to replace him, but Bill Gates just today announced he's donating $750 million to the Global Fund for HIV AIDS and Communicable Diseases. Uh, but uh, let's see here. We go to uh, its new structures in uh, the World Economic Forum. Was Slide will take you to the. Okay, if I just make it bigger, you're going to have Oops. There. Uh, okay. Public, right, right, right now, uh, both, both domestic CDC, we would not have been able to have responded to the anthrax crisis because it would have taken uh, eight weeks to go through the normal federal procurement process to get Dell computers because that was the computer that had, that had won, the, won the contract. Bernie Marcus at Home Depot uh, came to the rescue and supplied us with uh, 40 computers and television, big screen television sets uh, in the wake of 9-11 uh, and uh, 2001. That's against the law. He said, put me in jail. But he said, put him in jail. I mean, we're trying to do good, good things. Uh, um, let's see here. Go on to the next slide. Uh, yeah, global private sector has contributed just over the last 10 years to increase. Uh, how do you make this bigger? It's, it's getting to your question that they, the private sector is now becoming a bigger role, a player than the international uh, organizations, UN system, and otherwise, uh, and that we can no longer uh, ignore uh, ignore what they do, uh, and because these countries, uh, the, these uh, a lot of these companies, uh, I, it's very complex. Uh, and I was at a lecture at Stanford Business School on companies which are negotiated for concessions from certain countries. Uh, as a condition that they win the contract to extract minerals or drill oil, have to set aside, it's called set aside, 20% of uh, the money must go towards uh, socially beneficial projects like in South Africa, HIV uh, education. Another country it might be, uh, you're going to have to build wa a, a water system uh, in this country. Uh, and it's it's just something that uh, not not too many people know about, but it's uh, it's a way to implement change uh, based on a commercial transaction. You won't get this contract unless you build a hospital or you uh, set aside so much of your money for uh, sustainable uh, energy. Uh, or, uh, but uh, uh, it's an enormous amount of money, and this was uh, last year. Uh, disasters were never talked about at this sort of a forum. Uh, I mean, it was uh, the prime prime mortgage crisis or the problem of how to bail out AIG. And, and, but uh, new model of private sector participation in global uh, humanitarian assistance. And so uh, right now at WEF, World Economic Forum, they have a program partnerships for uh, humanitarian relief and how to mobilize globally uh, private sector and, and have that integrated with the overall UN uh, response. So it's uh, it's a big big deal now. Any other questions? Okay. okay well, thank you very much. Sure. For, for, for